Okay, it's uh, 7.01 p.m. on Monday, March 4th. This is a meeting of the Wellfleet Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. Uh, all seven trustees are in attendance. The meeting is being uh, recorded by the town and may be recorded by anyone else desiring to do so, so long as it doesn't interfere with the conduct of the meeting and the chair has been notified. Um, with that, uh, I don't have any announcements. I don't know if anybody else does. I would uh, like just to uh, mention that there, there's an updated schedule for the um, installation of the water main uh, um, from the Coles Neck Wellfield into town. And um, it now looks like the plan, the work, all the work will be completed by the fall of, the, of this year. So um, the will, work will stop at um, bottom <coughs> end, um, and there won't be any further digging or uh, um, pavement work after the end of May until November. So no work June, July, August, and September? Correct. And there, the schedule is posted on, um, on the town's website, the, the updated schedule. Mm-hmm. Any other announcements? Okay. Um, housing related status reports. I know that um, Rebecca has posted a timeline for the 95 Lawrence Road project. Um, I think that is available. I believe it's available on the town's website. I also do have the document in case anyone's interested in looking at it. But it looks like it's it's subject to several events that the town does not control directly. So um, you know, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty in when we actually get to the finish line. Any other housing related status reports? Um, Harry, Lane. Yep. I just wanna let everyone know that um, our request for a grant for a consultant to do a new housing study uh, was awarded by the Cape Cod Commission, $25,000. So um, I, I'd love to have that on the next agenda because I think it would be interesting to look at who we might want to involve in that study. Um, I was looking at some other housing plans and some towns even have their housing groups worked with the planning board. Um, mm -hmm. That might be a way of, um, but, but anyway, it's, it's good news. Um, mm -hmm. it, the, the grant is given to the town um, Rebecca will be in, in communication with the Cape Cod Commission. We'll have to do a scope of services, but um, the grant has to be spent by the end of December. So it will be a, a process um, to go through. And I would encourage everybody to look at the 95 Lawrence timeline. I mean, it would be great if things went as they propose. Um, there's a year's difference in the timeline, depending on what happens, but take a look at it. But according to it, they should really um, very soon start doing some um, community engagement with the broader public. Mm -hmm. and, and I hope when they do that, a bunch of us will also be part of that. <laughs> okay. Um, anything else? I have a question, Harry. Sure. Maybe for you and Michael. Um, I, I've been thinking about the town's uh, finances. Um, and I know that CPC money is segregated from the other money, but I don't know if it has any effect on the expenditure. Um, but would it make sense if we were interested in postponing both the trust request and the buy down request 
to a fall from a June meeting in terms of helping the town? Okay, we do have budgeting on the agenda, so we you can want to wait till then, Harry. Yeah, why don't we wait till then on that? Any other status reports? Okay, there there are two town meeting items that I've got on the agenda. The first one is um, the community impact fee, and we had uh, Ryan Curley at our last meeting, our March 7th meeting, I think it was. Um, and he talked about it, but we wanted to defer to give uh, Michael a chance to weigh in on that since uh, he was not at that meeting. Uh, I can uh, pop up the proposal, but basically <clears throat> the short-term rental tax allows two different community impact fees. <clears throat> now, the fees can range up to 3%. And uh, one of them is targeted to um, owner-occupied properties that have two or th three, or maybe it's two or more short-term rental units in them. And the second one is targeted towards um, professionally managed units that involve properties that are not the principal residence of the property owner. So there are two separate categories there. Um, and each one requires a separate town meeting vote. And presumably the town could set different percentages for those two categories if they chose to. Currently the proposal, as I understand it, that came out of the select board is for a town meeting vote to accept both of those statutes and to set a 1% community impact fee. Um, so uh, I think the select board is looking for a recommendation on this. And I think uh, since Michael is here, maybe we can start with Michael um, and give you an opportunity to talk about why 1% is what came out of the select board's discussions. Yeah, well, so there was a quite a bit of deliberation um and it's my understanding that it didn't only impl uh, impacts investor owned properties with two or more or uh it's, it's actually it's a fairly small percentage of the short-term rentals would actually be impacted by the tax it's not mm -hmm. going to uh, impact most of our short-term rentals you'd have to own two houses that you are renting short term in order for the user to pay the tax and i guess you know, I personally, I think um, it's good to establish a tax, but I think um, the actual impact of that tax is not substantial compared to getting a large percentage of our, of our actual short-term rental tax money, which is a much larger pool of money. And I think, you know, <clears throat> uh, sometimes if we, if we sort of have a chunk here, uh, it, it may uh, cause, you know, people to say, look, you already have this community impact fee, like, you know, that's enough. And so I kind of thought, you know, we just raised the tax from four to 6% on the short-term rental tax. And um, <clears throat> that increase plus, you know, another 1%, I think would be more palatable for voters to pass that rather than potentially re reject it anyways, because we keep raising the taxes overall. But I think our total tax burden right now um, without the short term, without the community impact fee is about 17% total is what, not just wealthy, but the total tax on short-term rentals. So it was two things like as, you know, uh, one, one thing is just a sort of a political reason of like, you know, we just keep increasing these taxes. That's fine. I'm fine with that if they actually have a large impact. I'm not sure that the 3% community impact fee, uh, according to the, the numbers from Provincetown, their community, the, the community impact fee is not actually contributing that much to their, short, to their tax base. So I thought it was good to establish it that, that this year, but to really focus on, you know, trying to direct 
a, a substantial percentage of the actual short-term rental tax to housing is more important. And I don't want to detract from that um, by sort of raising a tax that won't actually have much of an impact on the housing problem. So Okay, yeah. Yeah, Ryan Curley did call me this afternoon and told me that he estimated that each 1% of the community impact fee might raise about $50,000. So a 3% tax would raise approximately by his estimate 150,000 and a 1% tax would raise by his estimate about 50,000. Yeah, I'm not sure on those numbers. I, I talked to uh, Jay Coburn over at the CDP and he had basically said that the community impact fee money uh, has not been substantial for Provincetown as much as they expected it to be. So mm -hmm. I don't know what the numbers are, but really I think while we are as a housing trust trying to, you know, get a hold of the, the driving, you know, the, the, the real um, short-term rental tax revenue, which is a substantial amount of money, I didn't want to detract from that and sort of give people an opportunity to say, hey, you already have this community impact fee, you raised it to 3% and the minutia sort of gets lost in, in the conversation. So um, it can always get raised, but I, I just think it's really important to focus on actually trying to, you know, get funding from that, that short-term rental tax fee with that, you know. Okay, other, other, other comments? Um, can I ask, um, I mean, hopefully we're gonna get a big piece of the short-term rental tax. We're not getting it this year and maybe next year, right? right. Because of, of things. Does this community impact fee definitely go to affordable housing? It does, yeah. The, the way the select board voted that it would all go to affordable housing. A percentage of it has to go to affordable housing if you pass community impact fee, but only a small percentage uh, has to. But I think we voted to direct all of it towards uh, housing. So 100% would go to housing. And the other question is, who has to keep track of who these rentals are? Who's well, that's the thing is it's a tiered system. So the user is paying it. So like if you're renting on like Airbnb, if you have multiple accounts in Wellfleet, I guess you would get that tax or through a realtor, you know, if you have multiple properties in Wellfleet that you're renting short-term rental, that tax, but it would go on the user. So if you're a renter, if you rent from someone else, you're mm. sort of, um, if you rent from an investor property owner, you're going to pay that extra 3% or 2% or 1%. But if you rent from anybody else that is a single property owner, you're not paying it. So it's, it's not like a, an even equal tax across the board. And, you know, rightly so, I think maybe it should be attached to, um, you know, investment properties. But the, the fact is the whole short-term rental situation is a community impact. And, you know, I, I just, I know we're not going to get it right away, um, but it, it's, you know, 50,000, 100,000 is, is really, you know, not what this trust is looking for, I think, as mm -hmm. far as um, mm -hmm. revenue every year. But, I, but you know, I, it's, it's. There's multiple reasons. Like I did, I was, you know, I had my select board hat on too. So I, I'm interested in hearing what this trust has to say about it. And maybe you all feel like we should just get anything we can. And, and you know, that's that's a better strategy. I could be swayed. Uh, Gary? Yeah, um, <clears throat> well, I guess in general, um, $100,000 is not anything to sneeze at. No. Um, but. But the other thing about that money is there's no restriction on it. So if we're talking about workforce housing, this money could be directed to that. <clears throat> I don't believe uh, in the legislation that there's, is there any definition of affordability? I don't know. Uh, there, there isn't, uh, hang on a second here. Oh, oh, you're uh, looking at that, Harry, I yep. can tell you that. Uh, we asked the same question of CDP, um, two things we asked. What are the other towns in the, in the mid and out, outer Cape doing with regard to this? And, and really, can you size if one to 3% is a relatively small amount? I agree with you, Michael. It's not worth, if it's a, actually is $100,000, 
it, it might be worth that. I don't know that the resistance to one versus 3% mm -hmm. will be much different as opposed to another tax. Um, and if that's the case, and if it's in fact 100,000, and if it's what other towns are doing, then perhaps we should uh, pursue it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the other towns are doing, um, except uh, I don't know as far as percentages. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, what what the statute says about the community impact fee is that uh, no less than thirty five percent of any community impact fee uh, is, goes to quote affordable housing or local infrastructure end quote. So there's no restriction on. 65% of it and 35% has got to be housing or infrastructure. So, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I, I have not done a calculation to, to determine, you know, so I was just kind of relying on information that I got. About. Yep. Other, Kathleen? Do we as a group have any feeling to what the climate is going to be for affordable housing at this town meeting? Uh, I, I don't accept. Um, and I think the voters were very supportive at the last town meeting. Now, I don't know whether the continuing accounting challenges are going to change that or not. So I just don't have a sense of, of it. Uh, I think from a town meeting standpoint, a lot of a lot of this is someone else's ox is being gored by this tax. You know, it's not, you know, that there aren't very many. Um, well, I, I don't know. I mean, there could be people that live here that own more than one house and rent one as a short term rental. And there could be people that own a house with a second unit that they rent that way. So I can't say to a certainty that no person attending town meeting isn't going to feel the effect of this tax. So I, I don't you know. You need two, two short-term rental properties. Right. You need to have two properties that you're running as short-term rentals. That you own as right. an investment property. You own as right. an investment property. Yeah. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know the numbers well enough. To me, it seemed, you know, like it was a small enough amount and I, I, I am concerned about, you know, um, the short-term rental tax being sort of swallowed up, you know, by, you know, I, I don't know what the select board is going to look like um, after, after this election. Um, and, you know, hopefully they'll be very amicable to, towards housing, but there's a political problem too, right, of, of you know, there being a, a budget deficit Mm -hmm. And you know, short-term rental tax, and then departments and capital items, and all the things that go along with that. And so, I just felt like the the sort of minutia of the conversation about a community impact fee and actually how substantial it is would get lost in that argument, and we could maybe wind up, you know, further away from getting revenue because they say, hey, you're already allocated that, where in the future we could raise a community impact fee, it's already established, but at the 1%, but, you know, we, we'd still be able to say, look, we're getting a 1% community impact fee, but it's not this much money, but we really need, so, um, and that was my thinking, I guess it's kind of strategic, I, I don't know, but, mm -hmm. um, well, I think potentially there are other groups in town that want to go after that short term rental money and why give them fodder for it, mm -hmm. especially if they are put on the warrant side by side. Let's just say this comes first and it gets voted through at the three. To Mike's point, we don't know that somebody's not going to stand up and say, you just got that, even though it's small money compared to short-term rental money. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I, I would have been apprehensive to bring it bring it forward right now just because I I like feel laser focused on that substantial sum of short-term rental tax money because I feel like it's obviously the driving cause of our 
housing problem. So I just feel like that's where we need, that, that's where I want to focus is on that. But that it did get brought forward. I thought, well, we should establish the tax, but, um, but let's not detract from, you know, what the goal is, which is actually achieving a substantial portion of the, of the short-term rental tax component. So, I, I mean, I think it's tricky. I, I don't know. It's, it is what it is, you know? I yeah. mean, if it were 3% across the board on all properties, I would say, hey, let's just do it because it's, we need it, you know? Or maybe if we find out every other town does it. Right. But then I think we also have to look at, and I haven't put into a spreadsheet what every other town is doing with the short-term rental tax. And, and it does it does vary from town to town too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's just a lot of sort of uh, communication that needs to happen around the budget generally. Um, so it's tricky. If we have to vote for a recommendation today, we can obviously move forward on that. But if we don't actually have to deliver one today, maybe we could get the, the actual data about how, you know, how much is the potential revenue stream, the estimate of what the revenue stream will be and what other towns are doing and make a decision based upon that. I think if the select board, are they looking for us to make an adjustment or just either approve or disprove or, you know, be well, in favor this, or not? I think if the housing trust said, if you guys, and if this board or whatever this, this committee said, we think it should be 3%, but we still recommend that it get passed, you could send that message up to the select board. Um, and they could, you know, we could either change it or amend it or whatever. At this point, we, we don't have a town me meeting like coming up as quickly as we thought when we voted on this. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it, it it's one of those things that came up and it was like, are we going to vote and recommend? And I said, well, I, I'll vote to place it, but I would recommend it definitely if it was 1%, but I don't know about the 3% because it's complicated, I think, you know, the, as far as you know, well, uh, just for instance, uh, the wastewater fund separate situation, they want a piece of the short term rental tax money, the wastewater committee. And for me, I always say, well, you have access to the clean water protection fund. Well, the truth is, they do have access It's not going to cover the whole thing. Right. And, but it's, it's a, it's a way for me to sort of protect the fact that we want to move direct it towards short term rentals. And the same could be said of the community impact fee, I think, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, the, the town could decide to reallocate this at any time. It, I'm kind of confused about our town meeting. Is this on the June warrant? I thought it's I had on the June warrant right now, but I think Charlie's been working to break the warrant up a little bit for so fall and spring because we just decided to have two town meetings because we had 80 Warren articles. And then also, you know, it, it, it's likely that one of them is going to be a general override and, and that's going to take a lot of conversation, I think, you know, mm -hmm. and we don't want to have a marathon, you know, town meeting if we can avoid it. So. <laughs> Who gets yes. to decide where the, which warrant articles go so to which meeting? The select board would ultimately board. decide, but we're looking for the town administrator or the interim town administrator in this case to, to do that sort of uh, breakdown and bring it to us. And then if we decide we want something in the spring, we'll move it over to the spring or in the fall, we'll move it over to the fall, but it'll keep us from having to do it on the, on the select board meeting floor, which could take, I don't know. Mm. I mean, just a regular meeting takes four hours. So <laughs> I mean, knowing that we may have something large coming for the fall, hopefully, I would hope that some of the other affordable housing things would be put in the spring so that we don't end up being like this greedy thing in the fall and then we lose everything. So 
I would hope the select board takes that into consideration. Yeah, I mean, I think those are the kinds of things that we look for, you know, as far as recommendations from committees too, you know, mm -hmm. um, but ultimately it's, it's just going to be, uh, ha, I, I don't, I don't know. There's five of us. So. <laughs> um, I think Sharon has her hand up. Yeah. Um, I just like in the discussion about wastewater versus affordable housing, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's like, that's a tricky topic, I think, because we need money for improved wastewater if we're going to increase density on housing. So, you know, we need, we need opportunities to uh, improve people's septic systems or do whatever. I'm not exactly, sure, you know, I haven't really been following wastewater, but I know that improved wastewater and and higher density have to go hand in hand. So there needs to be some sort of balance, you know, between the two. That's my opinion. Okay. Anybody else want to weigh in? So I guess the question, the question is, do we want to uh, make a recommendation on adopting a community impact fee? And do we want to be specific about what percentage we're recommending or do we just want to recommend it? My sense is, is that uh, the consensus is in favor of recommending a community impact fee. The real question is, what should the percentage be? And I guess to me, that's a little less critical because that is changeable by town meeting vote as required or as desired. So then let's go ahead and just vote on whether we want to recommend it. Okay. So does somebody want to offer a motion to recommend the community impact fee? So I make a motion. Go ahead, Elaine. <laughs> so Elaine, is there a second? Sure, second. Okay. Okay, so this is just to recommend it without talking about the percentage, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Debate, any? Okay, seeing none, we'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Mike? Aye. Jim? Aye. Gary? Aye. Kathleen? Aye. Elaine? Aye. Sharon? Aye. And the chair votes aye, so that's seven in favor and none opposed. That motion's adopted. Do you want to recommend a specific percentage? Or do you want to just leave that to the select board at this point? Can we wait until we get more information from the CDP? Sure. We can wait right up until it shows up on the floor of town meeting. So let's put it to. on our next agenda. Okay. Okay. Mate, could I ask a question? Mike, sure. has this already, the percentage has already been voted on by the select board, correct? Well, yeah. I mean, we, we it came up, Ryan brought it up at 3% and we talked about, you know, okay. different, some different aspects of it and who it would impact and how much it would impact. And then ultimately we voted to place it and recommend it at 1% but that could be amended, you know, and I'm not, I'm certainly not opposed to it uh, being higher. I, I just, I didn't quite, I didn't feel comfortable at the time uh, making a recommendation um, on the above 1%. Okay. Okay. Well, that's, that's that item. Next one is a uh, zoning proposal that I think originated with uh, with Ryan, and if you give me a minute, I'll pop it up. Um, uh, but basically, it is to um, make the uh, uh, permit cottage colonies to be uh, occupied on a year round basis. Here's the, uh, so let me share my screen. Here we go. So basically what 
this proposal has done is it's taken the current definition of cottage colony, which is, has been renamed cottage colony NSP and is in red, and it's created a new definition that strikes out the seasonal restriction. So, and then the use table is revised so that um, the cottage colony without the seasonal restriction is allowable in all districts except the seashore district. And the cottage colony NSP is not allowed in any district. I assume that's to preserve whatever lawfully pre-existing non-conforming status some of those have. So it's, um, so that's, that's the proposal. And in, in effect, what it would do is it would remove the seasonal occupation restriction for cottage colonies in every district except the seashore district. Comments? I have a question. Yes. Um, why do we have the those square footage in there as the definition? Because we certainly have cottage colonies with smaller than 550 square feet and larger than 768 square feet. Okay, well that def that number has been there, I think, since the late 70s at least. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think it shows up and I don't. I used to have a complete collection of Wellfleet bylaws going, zoning bylaws going back to the end of time, or beginning of time, but uh, I left those when I retired. But I think that that square footage restriction has been in there at least since the 1975 revision and possibly from earlier than that. So what do we call the cottages that are smaller and larger? Uh, lawfully pre-existing non-conforming uses. Got it. <laughs> this did come up in the select board meeting. Helen brought it up like, let's just make it a round number. And in the end, we just wanted to keep it simple by not changing too much in the definitions. But I don't, I don't really know why we need to have a minimum of 550 square feet for somebody who wants to live in a one bedroom or studio or whatever. But, and and it is but also, huh? it's also true that uh, in almost all of the condominium projects in Wellfleet, the condominium documents contain seasonal restrictions, you know, each one of which has been individually negotiated with the Board of Appeals when those things were permitted. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them have seasonal restrictions in them as well. And it would require those condominiums to go back to the Board of Appeals to get that restriction removed from the condominium documents because the condominium documents all say that that can't be removed without the consent of the appeals board. But they have been doing it in Truro successfully. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I'm not really sure if I, and I don't want to belabor it, but the fact that the square footage in there, is that going to deter certain, like, is that going to um, preclude certain associations that don't fit within that square footage? I think because um, the cottage colony that if it's, this is a definition change, Mm -hmm. So it's changing the definition. If it's already a non-conforming use, then it still fits as a cottage colony, I guess. I'm not so sure how clear it is that those those ones would qualify too. Uh, Harry might have a better idea, well, uh, but I, would yeah, think I mean, non-conforming, they would be able to do it. Yeah, I mean, it certainly is possible that there are cottage colonies out there that have units that are uh, smaller than 550 square feet or larger than um, whatever the number is. It's 768. Obscured. Yeah, it's obscured by the camera here. Um, it's also possible that there may be pre existing cottage colonies that have some units that are occupied on a year round basis, too. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and this wouldn't change, wouldn't change that. Okay. So, I mean, 
the wealth leader will never be year round. I can tell you that, but I can tell you that the two bedrooms mm -hmm. within the wealth leader, which are pretty generously sized are 525 square feet. And the three bedrooms are 775 square feet. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a perfect example if it wasn't where it is and come with all its other complexity. But I think Brownie's cabins are a great, you know, to take advantage, to have some of those go year round. Mm -hmm. And I would bet that there are units in there. I know there are units in there that are smaller than the 550. Mm -hmm. And I would think larger units, my gosh, why would we penalize any condo that's larger? So as long as the, it's considered pre-existing and we think it would be fine, then it matters not. If we think it's going to preclude, then I think we need to go back and adjust that information because it makes no sense. I guess my take on this is that uh, this certainly does, does no harm and might help. But I think it's clear every time you touch the zoning bylaw that, you know, you're really... Uh, you're really kind of attaching yourself to a tar ball that <laughs> takes you know, that really takes a lot of understanding to unravel. Um, Gary, so, yep, go ahead, Gary. Yeah, um, go ahead. I, I, we, this came up at the partnership meeting, and I would say people had were confused. Mm -hmm. um, the 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 size notwithstanding can you tell me what the what we think the impact will be of this is it that now there's only one unit within a cottage colony that can be year round mm -hmm. and that after this every unit in the cottage colony could be year round i guess the answer would be yes as long as it fits in this definition of a cottage colony you know so it, because what, has, what has happened in Truro is no. that structures that have been built more recently, um, the whole association generally has to agree they're going to do this unless the condominiums have individual setups. So part of the reason this will never happen at the wealth leader is that everything is very connected with septics and water. And there's no way you're going to get 21 owners who will agree to winterize all of that. But if there is an association where either things are separated more and not all the water has to be turned on. And, but in Truro, what has happened is the entire association has to agree to do it and then it passes and then they either winterize them and make them available for year round usage. Um, or if they're not all in one, like there's some on shore road where they're all connected that they've done that. Mm -hmm. If they're set as separate little cottages and it can just be done by cottage, everybody has to agree to let them do it, but they've been able to do it. Yeah, if it's a cottage colony that has not been condoed, then there's one owner who gets to make all of the decisions. But if it's been condoed and if these seasonal restrictions are in the master deed, you need to be able to amend the master deed, which probably requires, you know, a super majority of unit owners to agree to it. So there, there are some roadblocks independent of the zoning bylaw, but um, I guess the question is what harm comes from uh, enabling them to do this if they can manage it? with all of the other things that are faced, you know, that would affect it. At the partnership meeting, the question was, what component of this is affordable housing? Um, and, yes. and I know the hope is that these will be small units, but given the, the, um, the nature of the market right now, I mean, we just happened, um, we had friends looking for a little place and they looked at the, um, those very small places that are just uh, now being condomized, condominiumized uh, past Mayo Beach. Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, in excess of $800,000. And rather than making things more affordable, I'm afraid they will make things less affordable. If in fact, 
the, the, the association goes through this and those uh, homes then become uh, year round and worth uh, you know, something north of $800,000. However, Gary, you have to think about something like Green Haven. So you can't take like a beachfront walk to town. That's always going to be just a much more expensive. But you take an association like Green Haven, which is right on Route 6. Mm -hmm. And if those units, even if they all went year round and two of them were rented to year round people or people lived in them year round, that would be a real bonus to our affordable housing stock. And since the properties already exist, I think it's certainly worth giving the opportunity. Um, can you, what, what is the approximate, I'm sorry, Michael, you had your hand up. No, no I have I, I'll, I'll wait till you ask that question. Maybe I can. How, how, many, how many of these cottage colonies do you think would uh, create something in the as crazy it is today affordable uh, range. I don't. That's what I I'm trying think to understand. If they are interested, and the only ones I think that are more likely to be interested um, <laughs> are ones that are away from the water. If the ones that are near the water are not affordable, although. I mean, I've sold units on Kendrick Avenue, 204 Kendrick Avenue. It's a two unit condo association. One of those units, a firefighter lives in year round. They're both year round cottages. They're 528 square feet. I sold the second one for 425,000. So to a degree, there is affordability when things are smaller and that's by the water. But if you just start taking like, let's just say deck two down yep. off of route six, Green Haven, Brownies cabins, like yep. those kind, the ones that are on designers road, like yep. things like that, you're never gonna, they're not gonna be $800,000 because they're near route six, they're small. Um, I think there's potential that one or two or three associations would vote this in and we would get some affordable housing out of it. I defer to you know the market much better than I. I just the concerns that were expressed during our meeting were, you know, to what degree does this really add to our affordable stock? Mm -hmm. or, or rather just does it turn into a windfall for for folks. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That that was a little bit my concern is that is this gonna have basically just the effect of increasing people's property values without actually freeing up any homes to be used as year round rentals for people in the community. Um, but I think the fact that someplace like deck two and someplace just for instance, or, or green Haven exists that, you know, it's worth it. You know, it's kind of like, what harm does it do if it, does raise some property values because the reality is that people aren't interested in buying a seasonal condominium if they want to live here year round. So those that whole market of kind of tiny homes doesn't exist for you because there are no year round units that get sold really. And if they do, they're probably jacked up a little bit anyways because they're the only one. So it's a rare that one comes up for sale that's year round you know, or it could be converted to year round or something like that. So in the end, I think, is it going to have a massive impact? It's doubtful to me, but will it maybe make some housing available uh, for people to purchase who live here? Probably, you know, so, so that I'm in full support of it, but you know, it's, it's not the solution, but it's part of it, I guess. Well, how about um, we consider uh, voting to support the concept and not the specific language so that we don't because the you know the specific language is a little bit uh, I keep wrestling with it uh, but uh, you know a motion for example to support the the concept of making cottage colonies uh, usable year-round where where permissible something like that 
Sounds good. It works for me. I mean, the, 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 the truth is that it was going to have to go before the planning board and get and, torn apart by then. And, and, you know, the language will get hashed out unless somebody brings it up as a um, petitioned article. I think, sorry, Harry. Go ahead. I, I think um, maybe it would be more useful to, to recommend the article or not, just as far as it going to town meeting. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess if, if people don't feel comfortable with the language, then maybe it makes sense to not issue a recommendation. Well, that would be the recommendation for this article. It would be that you know we recommend okay. the concept of making cottage colonies usable year round. So when it shows up in the warrant, it would say recommended by the Affordable Housing Trust. And there'll be a you know, one sentence explanation, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Um, you, can I ask, uh, someone mentioned the planning board. Uh, I did actually ask Ryan and he said he had no idea. Michael, has, has it gone to the planning board? And I don't think the planning board's taken it up yet, no. So doesn't I, that- I haven't happen? been following closely, so. Oh. I haven't, I haven't, uh, we just kind of await the planning board when these things go through and see what happens. So likely this won't be until the fall town meeting anyway. It may be split into the fall town meeting. Yeah. Just to not complicate. I mean, look, we're spending this much time on it, you know, so. I think if it's going to go to fall town meeting, perhaps it could be more clear. Right. Yeah. Agreed. Yep. Maybe go to town council and to the planning board. Mm. I well, the town council will ultimately see it for sure. And I wonder what the language is in Truro because Truro has already passed it and are already putting it, they're already putting it into action. So I wonder if that's where Ryan got it from. That's a good point. We should compare. And that was a discussion that started in 2017, by the way. Truro? Truro, yes. Because I, I was the town planner when that first popped up. <laughs> so what's your pleasure? Do nothing? Do a vanilla kind of recommendation or do something more specific? If we don't have a deadline to have a recommendation for the warrant, if we defer for another meeting and hopefully get clarity, have we lost anything? No, no. We always have the ability to stand up in town meeting and say this yeah. is the housing trust's recommendation. Exactly. So we could we could wait until June if we had to. I don't think we should do that because that I think says it was muddied waters, and I think on anything that's affordable housing, we should try to get in line. Mm -hmm. Um, but if we think it's not going to be on the June meeting, can we just, I don't know when, whether it's going to be or not. I, I don't, we have not seen the updated split warrant. So, so can we approve it if it's on June and have another conversation with Ryan, if it's not. Yeah, I think we, I think probably if we're going down this road, we should probably just vote to approve the concept. But not the language. Make a recommendation that says we approve the com concept of, or we, whatever it is that Harry said. I, okay. I mean, I already voted to recommend it on the select board, so it doesn't. I have no issue. I think it's today. important, though. I think words matter, yeah. and I think recommendations matter. I agree. And I think when people look at the affordable housing things and they know how passionate we are, if we're not all in. I think that sends a message. And I think on things that are, you know, gonna potentially help affordable housing, that we should take a stronger stand. So I think we should either approve it if it's gonna be for June or at least vote on it. And then I think for, um, if it goes to fall and we can have a conversation to make it less cumbersome and confusing, I think that would be helpful. I agree with Kathleen. Mm -hmm. I do too. I'm just not quite sure how we make that happen. 
since we don't know if it'll be on the spring or fall? Well, we should act with the assumption that it's going to be on the Springtown meeting. And if it's not on the Springtown meeting, we have several meetings in which to reconsider our, our position. Harry, okay. could you, Harry, could you, could you make the motion again so we understand the okay. wording? Yeah, here's, I've, and I've been kind of picking away at it, that we support the concept of allowing cottage colonies to be occupied year round where possible. That's what I ended up with after fooling with it a bit. But, but if the language stands the way it is in here right now, I'm concerned about the size restrictions here, you know, the, mm -hmm. the 550 to 768 square feet. Um, that could be, you know, very difficult, you know, going forward. Yes, it could be. And we also don't know what's going to come out of the planning board. Right. You know, so there's some unknowns here. Okay. And that's kind of one of the reasons why I suggested that we do something a little more generic than saying than being specific. I'm good with that, Harry. And then if it's if it doesn't if, if it's not on the Springtown meeting, then we we work towards clarification and and are more specific in our recommendation for the fall. Okay, well, I'll offer that as a motion and we'll see whether there's a second or not. Second. That was Mike. <laughs> I think. So I, yeah, Michael. Yeah. yeah, when I'm sharing my screen, I can only see four of you. So I sometimes okay. have to guess. Yeah, um, so um, discussion? Well, I would defer to those who know the real estate market better. If you think that we really get some affordable units out of it, then you know I can support the concept of it, and we'll try to clean up both the language and the impact. And be, it'd be good to know what Truro did and what impact it's had on affordability. I don't think it's capital A. Yeah, yeah, I don't think so either. But. No. I also don't think that um, we know yet because it just right. passed last year. So they're, they're in the process of getting the master deeds changed, the places winterized and all of that. So. Do we know if other towns have done this uh, or not? I do not. Uh, Provincetown, the, all the condos are year round. So. Okay. I did see the, I did okay. see that one of brownies sold today for three hundred and twelve thousand dollars. So that's affordable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> hey, any more discussion? Okay, seeing none. The, the motion we have is to support the concept of allowing cottage colonies to be occupied year round where possible. Uh, roll call, Mike. Michael, aye. Uh, Jim. Aye. Gary. Aye. Kathleen? Aye. Elaine? Aye. Sharon? Aye. Chair votes aye. That's seven in favor, none opposed. Okay, the next item of business is our budget. And I have a lot less clarity than I had. Let me stop sharing here. <coughs> I have a lot less clarity than I thought I would have by now. Uh, I don't know if Gary knows any more about where we are. Uh, I did have a conversation with uh, Mary um, Leonard, um, the, one of the people who are working on the reconciliation yep. about both the um, housing trust uh, accounting and CPC housing accounting. And uh, there was no, uh, no detail that I received other than Harry, she asked me for the question of when the date, uh, when the official start date of the trust would be, uh, so that she could allocate money based upon a, a date mm -hmm. um, in terms of donations. Um, but that's the only thing I heard. Okay. Well, I think that there are still two things we can talk about. One of them is we can talk about uh, whether we should have a consolidated budget managed by the housing trust for 
all of our housing initiatives, including ones that are managed by the housing authority. And then the second thing is we could look at what I already have for a catalog of housing programs that we offer and see whether we wanna to add to that. I'm not sure we're at a point where we can be very specific about attaching numbers to them yet. But so those are two things we could talk about. And uh, you had mentioned something uh, at the beginning about uh, CPC oh, so, funding. Yes. Right, I have a question. I, um, <clears throat> you know, we have two CPC housing items that have been approved, which uh, Michael, maybe are CPC items likely to go to the fall town meeting or the Springtown meeting, or we just, don't know yet. I don't know yet, uh, Gary. I'm, I'm not sure. And and my question is, um, I think CPC funds are segregated from other receipts. Mm -hmm. Yes. So deferring on expending money, does that have any effect? For the no. any positive effect in terms of the budget uh, pressures? No. no, it really doesn't, Gary. Because yeah, that's right. That that three percent surcharge is segregated the That's cpc right. gets to decide how to recommend and the town meeting can only approve appropriations from that that are consistent with the cpc's recommendations so it's completely outside the, no, the no rest of the other agree. issues okay. no, i take i take back my comment yeah. so there's really no reason for that not to be on the uh the spring, spring town, town meeting because that would make the funds available so um, I can show you what I had for a, let's get rid of that guy. Um, Okay, let me, what is going on? Oh, here we go. Share screen. Got it. Just looking. Okay. Um, this is a document that is pretty old at this point, uh, but it really was an attempt to at least capture what we had in the way of housing projects or housing related projects. So, uh, the rental units at 2082 State Highway, that kind of takes care of itself uh, because that's managed by uh, the Orleans Housing Authority and there's a, a reserve associated with that. And I guess the income goes into that reserve. Is that right, Elaine? Well, the income just goes into a bank account and we mm -hmm. were advised that we should never spend down below 35,000 to help yeah. make sure we can do the maintenance. I think there's about $60,000 in that mm -hmm. account, but we need to reserve that much for potential repairs and needs. Okay. Um, and then a uh, uh, rental assistance program. Um, Elaine and I have discussed with uh, both programs are currently administered by the Homeless Prevention Council, HPC, mm -hmm. and we have discussed um, collapsing those two into just rent, rental assistance since the emergency is somewhat uh, mitigated at this point. Um, I don't know where that stands. Yeah, and I don't really know. There was a $185,000 appropriation for rental assistance. I don't know what the balance of that is or if there is a balance. Hopefully there is, but we don't know either. <laughs> yeah, and the same thing with the emergency. I'm sorry, go ahead, Gary. In, in rental assistance, it was money that was funded by the um, community block grant Yep. Uh, money uh, that we got for that. Um, and in theory, funds have been administered for that program against that account. 
Mm -hmm. um, but since they are now both administered by the same entity, HBC, and now we put them in as a single item. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think it would be hard to come up with a, a balance. Okay. <clears throat> and housing buy down, we did we did one in Feb March, actually, I guess it was. So we don't currently have anything appropriated for housing buy down, is that right? It's mm, technically, right. There is a little bit of, of unspent money mm -hmm. um, because the, the grant is 175 and the 10,000 is the administrative costs. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know we have to uh, do substantial um, advertising because of fair marketing. Right. Well, we should. So uh, there is a small amount of unspent mm -hmm. uh, balance. Mm -hmm. But it probably will be spent. Mm -hmm. But we did request another buy down for CPA, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, we requested it. What happened to the request? Do we know? Yes, it's been approved by the um, the CPC, and it was uh, sent to the select board. Have you voted, Michael, yet on on CPA articles? I don't think we have. Don't they have to go on the warrant, no matter what? They do. Yes. They yes, they do, but we voted. I'm just curious whether select board has approved them or not. I think mm -hmm. I'd have to look back and see. We've jumped all over the place because originally um, I'd have to look back and, and see if we've acted on, on the CPAs. Michael, just as an aside, uh, while some of them are not time sensitive, the big one is 315,000, I think it is for the playground. And yeah, they're, they're hoping to. I'm uh, pretty sure we voted on that, actually. Uh, oh, if you voted on that, maybe you voted on the others, too. But maybe we did. I, I just don't want to say we did if we have. Right. Okay. So yeah. I'm just saying that if if you haven't already, that that one is really time. Yeah. Sensitive. But okay, it has well, to go on yeah. the warrant. So mm -hmm. um, everything that that's going to be on the spring warrant has to get voted and recommended on time. But that one, you need a vote from the select board. Yes, because they're hoping to enter into a contract on the state um, um, providers uh, so that it can be built in the summertime. And that doesn't have to get to the town meeting first? No, it'll be if the select board approves it, then it'll go to the warrant. The town meeting will okay. approve it. Yeah. But, um, but if it's right, on I'll, the warrant. I'll, I'll check that. I'll run it okay. by uh, Ryan and see if we've already done. I'm pretty sure we voted on that. And we might have voted on. Uh, the other CPA okay. stuff as well. Um, okay, let's see. A housing specialist, that's the contract with the CDP. Mm -hmm. And that's another one. It would be great to know what the balance mm -hmm. is on that. Yeah. Well, well, I, that I one... talked to Lisa Suve probably about I don't know maybe it was a couple of weeks ago and she said she was working on all this stuff now so. mm -hmm. well maybe I need to check in with her but I what I'd like to be able to do is at least make sure I have a clear understanding of what we're doing um, now is, is our current contract with CDP expire or Yes, it probably does. Okay. We have we have uh, um, entered into a new contract with them. Essentially, it's the same contract approved again. Okay. And let's see, estate planning support. Uh, I don't know what's happened with that. Yeah, there, there's going to be a smaller balance left, but mm -hmm. I almost feel at some point we should give that money back. Mm -hmm. That was is that, is that CPA funds? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 
Okay. And the housing authority admin, I think that they reduced that to $4,500 last in the last Correct. budget. Correct. You know, I don't, since I wasn't around too, I didn't receive the budget form to make a request this year. I have no idea what mm. might have happened with that. I hope okay. they get this to and, and we asked for $10,000 in administrative support for the uh, housing trust. And I had one question from one select board member about it and have heard nothing. So I don't know whether that's uh, disappeared as um, or whether it's it's actually built in somewhere. So we'll find out. We've survived without it for a year and a half, and I suppose we'll survive without it for longer if necessary, but, you know. And let's see. Our sources of income, uh, the town meeting support for the housing authority, uh, CPA funding, which will not be 500,000 for fiscal 23. Uh, whatever is in the old affordable housing trust. <coughs> and we have some rental income from the state highway property and an unknown amount of donations and an unknown amount of unspent mother money and uh, from other appropriations. So that's all I know. Harry. Yes. With regard to the 500,000, yep. we did spend 175 on the um, yes. the most recent buy down. So at a minimum, it's reduced by that amount. Let me see you can tell. My touch typing is getting worse. And that's the only thing I think we spent out of that five hundred thousand dollars to date. Correct. Um, I think, in many respects, um, once the grants that the housing authority has gotten from the CPA are spent down, that future ones do go under the trust because. You know, the housing authority is really a state agency and the trust yes. is a town agency and can call on more town support directly. Like, you know, the housing authority has always been asked to have our own representation, which is why we would hire Peter Freeman and have to pay mm -hmm. him for things because we were not a town group. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't think it makes sense. I don't know if it makes sense to transfer what's left in some of these projects. Um, it's just that the, the trust will need someone to serve as the financial person when that happens, because it does involve interacting and, you know, creating mm -hmm. warrants and, and um, turning them in. Yes. And we do have a treasurer. We've not called upon him to do anything just yet. <laughs> but that day may come. <laughs> Hopefully it will come. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Uh, so uh, I guess the other question, this has been very useful. I think the other question I had is, is about consolidating all of the funding within the Affordable Housing Trust, which I think we, you know, my, my, my sense is that that probably makes sense and it should make uh, accounting easier for the town puts a little bit of the burden on us to allocate the resources program by program instead of having the town do it. It perhaps gives us a little bit more flexibility in that we don't necessarily have to wait to a town meeting to change something if it's, you know, if a program is funded out of a block grant with, uh, you know, like a, a block grant from the CDP for, uh, no, I'm sorry, from the CPC, for, exist, for instance, for general housing purposes, we'd have some flexibility to allocate that instead of it being 
you know, allocated to specific programs. So I think that you can make a case, or at least it seems to me that you can make a case that perhaps we should consolidate all of the housing funding in one place. But I'd be curious to think, to, to hear what um, the rest of you feel about that. I support the concept. I think as a practical matter, it's a little tricky. If town meeting voted to fund the buy down <laughs> to the housing authority, mm -hmm. which is how it is, has been proposed and mm -hmm. is proposed again this year, I don't know if we could change that authorization without bringing it back to town meeting, could we? Uh, no, I don't think we could. And, right. you know, maybe this is a project that we attack uh, in bits and pieces. So if this one is going to go to the housing authority to do a buy down, maybe the, the next one we should request go to the trust. Right. Elaine, what do you think? I mean, I, we we could entertain changing the the um, recipient from the housing authority to the to the trust, but that would require you know activity by the CPC and, and the select board and the select board and uh, you know. But if we did it now, we wouldn't have to readdress it at town meeting. Yeah, I, I think rather than uh, putting together requests for a bunch of do-overs. Mm. I'd much rather say that as we make new requests for funding, um, that we try and direct them to the housing, to the housing trust, and let the trust administer them, rather than going back and trying to redo something the town's already voted. So that's the only one I'm aware of, Harry. That's forward going. That still mm -hmm. goes to the housing authority. Mm -hmm. There is a request for the trust. Monies that come from the town could be redirected to the trust. Question would be uh, the accounts that exist once mm -hmm. we get some accounting to them, mm -hmm. whether we could transfer them. But I certainly support the concept of having it all under one umbrella. Okay. Other comments? I agree. Uh, I, agree. I think it, mm -hmm. it makes sense to put it under one umbrella. I would agree. Okay. okay. Well, we'll you know we'll just proceed on that basis because uh, we don't have anything specific that we need to act on right now. That's really all I've got budget-wise. I had thought we were going to spend more time on this tonight, but um, given how little we know at this point, I think that's just all we can really do. And then I, emblematic of that, I did send you the uh, uh, budget framework that uh, Shelley put together and it's basically really doesn't have anything in it to speak of, so. $500,000. Yep, and that's carried forward from the last town meeting. That's where that came from. Um, anything else on budgeting? You think, uh, Elaine? Do we have any more clarity on w when we would need money for uh, 95 Lawrence based upon Rebecca's memo? Um, I actually, uh, Jay Colburn did email me today and said they wanted, he wanted to check in about that. Um, I think that's an actually an interesting question. It would be my recommendation that POA CDP make a request to the CPA for the million dollars or whatever it is they're going to ask for. I guess that would be as opposed to asking the trust to ask for it. I, I'm not sure exactly what he wants to talk about, mm -hmm. but um, I think that might be something we should actually. Yeah, the number in their proposal was $500,000. And uh, I, I get the impression that other Projects like this, the request has been vetted by a fiscal consultant to see whether it was uh, objectively necessary in that amount. So much like the exercise we went through with Emily Actenberg uh, trying to look at their proposal, uh, it, uh, I get the impression that when the request finally shows up, 
it's part of a financing package that um, the, we should have somebody look at to make sure that the request is is uh, reasonable and necessary. But that's um, that project is right now is kind of running outside the housing uh, the housing trust. Mm -hmm. Right. But I think as as you indicated, Harry, that when they make a request, um, I think it should go either through or to the trust as opposed to the housing authority. Oh, agreed. But I think their first request should go to the CD CPA. I can't, I mean, I mean, for what purpose, Elaine? I think that's pretty much how it's been done. I mean, in, in most of these projects, the developer requests CPA funding. And then in, in other instances, at the end of the project, when they've needed more money, they come to the trust. But I don't see why we as a trust should have to go to the CPA asking for it. It's their project. I think they should be asking for it to start with. That, I mean, if, if Jay is asking for an opinion, that certainly would be my opinion. Mm -hmm. How other people feel? No, I, I don't think, think it really matters, but I I agree. Yeah. I mean, okay. agree, Harry, that it doesn't matter, or you agree with Elaine? I I agree that it doesn't really matter. So that means I can agree with Elaine also. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think let, let them do the work. Hmm? Let yeah. them do the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they bring a lot of um, strength and um, they're, they're the, you know, I, I feel like they've heard from us so much, it would be good for them to hear from the developers. Um, um, for the money that has both been awarded and for the requests that have come from other projects, it's come from the developer. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. And it's come from the developer accompanied by, uh, this is the financing package we've right. been able to assemble and this is the this is the gap we need to have you fill. Right, and you know, not well, honestly, it's a two inch thick yeah. um, binder of mm -hmm. material. It's also not necessarily a gap at this point. It's showing that the town is supporting the project, which helps them. I mean, they're mm -hmm. gonna be looking for $21 million in funding. So mm -hmm. they, I've, you know, they are looking for the town's buy-in showing the support. It's, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily a gap at this early point in the process. Okay. Um, Harry, would you like to be in on that conversation with Jay? Sure. When, when is it? You're going to talk to him tomorrow? Um, I'm not sure that's going to work out. I, I asked him if it could wait. I, I get back to Wellfleet next week, and that would, yeah. that would be a lot more convenient, but um, that would be better for me too. I've got my okay. annual physical tomorrow morning, so I'll tell him it tomorrow's not good because it's yeah. it's not great for me either, and I don't see why I can't wait. I think that would be great if you were in on that conversation. Yeah. Okay, and okay, and and uh, uh, I did have a conversation with him, which I'll talk to you all about when we get to the ADU agenda item. Um. 90 Freeman Ave. Here is what has happened. We set the RFP draft to Shelley Goring at Mass Housing Partnership. Uh, uh, Laura, Laura, no, sorry, Laura Schufeld, sorry, I'm getting the, uh, and got back her comments, which was basically kind of simplify it a bit. Uh, the, there was really too much stuff in there that was for uh, a multiple dwelling unit project. So um, I then I talked to uh, uh, Becky, and she sent me one that she had used on two projects at other towns she'd worked in. So I reviewed that one, and based on all those comments, I revised the the thing to try and simplify it, and also to try and make it clear that the housing authority was the awarding authority because that would be consistent with the town meeting vote to transfer to the housing authority. So I did that, I sent the draft out to all of you. I also requested that the uh, town prepare a deed to the housing, 
housing authority to transfer that property consistent with the, the previous town meeting vote. And that got sent off to town council. Uh, and I had uh, my, my question that accompanied that request was, is the existing town meeting vote sufficient authority for the housing authority, instead of building a house themselves to transfer the property to a developer with a land disposition agreement and have the developer build it and sell it to an affordable eligible customer. That doesn't look like it got addressed because a draft deed came back on Friday and I just looked at it today and I can pop the draft up, but it, the, the condition in the deed seems to be that it's transferred to the housing authority with permission for the housing authority to transfer it to an affordable eligible buyer subject to a deed restriction. It, the deed doesn't seem to allow us to transfer it to a developer to build an affordable house to transfer to a eligible purchaser. So I've got to circle back around on that. I've, I've got the deed somewhere here. Uh, I don't recall whether it's in an email, but then that came in on Friday. Um, it's tentatively on the select board's agenda for April 12th, next Tuesday, uh, to either discuss or to discuss and vote on, but I, I think that what I get back for a draft is not, does not do what we want to be able to do. So there's a, yet another round of conversations that has to take place. So that's what I know. Um, I think the RFP is in pretty good shape, but I'm not convinced that the title to the property is in the condition we need it to be in. So that's where we are. So Harry, on the RFP, as we get closer to putting it out, these yep. dates obviously will be filled in and oh, yeah. timing will be decided on some of the yep. stuff. Because, mm -hmm. So who decides on some of this timing? Is those, are those conversations <clears throat> that should be happening? Um, basically, I, I think it, it all flows pretty obviously from whatever date the RFP is issued, because uh, typically you want to have give uh, potential responding organizations enough time to put together a response and file it. Um, and then uh, you also need to allow some time for uh, questions because there may be amendments to the RFP in response to questions. Somebody says, you know, this doesn't make sense or uh, uh, so after you, after the RFP is issued and before the response date, usually there's an intermediate date there where people can submit questions and, and, and an amendment is published. And then once you get to the end of that, probably we should have you know 60 days to look at the proposals and make an award it's not going to be i think anywhere near as complicated as 95 lawrence road because we're mm -hmm. talking about you know a half acre lot that's going to have one 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 unit on it but probably not a lot of bids or yeah, probably a not a lot of responses so but you know so so you know so that probably means start to finish you're probably looking at five months, you know, if you have 90 days for the, the, from when it's issued to when you get responses and another 60 days to evaluate the responses and then you make an award. So, you know, I, I would think that that's probably what the timing is gonna be like, but that's something that um, whoever's doing the procurement from the town will, will weigh in on, probably Becky. And just based on experience with, you know, the, the way these things go timing wise. Harry, given that this is a relatively uh, small project and that uh, much time has already passed. Yep. Um, is there any way to issue the RFP now uh, and then clear up the need in 
while we're in the process? I'd be reluctant to do that because uh, if we were advised that the language in the town meeting vote does not, you know, does not allow us to transfer the property to a developer, then we'd have to go back to town meeting. So I would like to get that answered first. And then, you know, the other the other issue is you're issuing an RFP saying, you know, send us a pros proposal on this piece of property, which we expect we'll get the title to, but we don't have it. You know, it's kind of, you know, I'd, I'd rather have everything done and, and complete so that somebody you're, who's you're 100%, submitting. Right. I, I believe okay. you're 100% correct. Yes. I guess we're trying to. <laughs> Expedite it. Expedite. Yeah. Well, the, the one thing oh. that I will say is, um, I mean, I am certainly of the mindset, having been through RFPs before in this town on small parcels and shown up, you know, to see who was there, the people that show up are Habitat. Yeah. So if we think that Habitat is the one that's going to do this, my understanding is that our Old King's Highway lawsuit yep. is actually um, coming up in the next two weeks. And so oh. the timing, I think, if we want to get this moving along um, and hopefully we prevail there, mm -hmm. um, could coincide nicely. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, and then there's one other question is, do we want to rely on town council or does the housing authority want to go back to Peter Freeman and, and uh, have him review this as council for the housing authority? And that's really a question for uh, Elaine. We could do that. I am a little worried about what town council might say. <laughs> well, the email that came back with the deed said, uh, you know, if the housing authority has counsel, it should probably uh, have, you know, give this to counsel to review. Well, Gary's shaking well, his head. I'd like to see the deed. I feel like I haven't seen the deed. Well, you haven't, because it came to me in an email on Friday. Okay. And uh, let me just see if I can find it. It may still be in the email. That's why I... Because, uh... I mean, the town meeting vote is very amorphous it just says to give it to the housing authority for affordable housing purposes right so who wrote the deed this deed town council wrote it okay oh we, elaine has the housing authority actually accepted the deed or have been a party no. to the we deed seen it. we haven't yeah. seen uh, it. it it hasn't uh Okay, I think I got to open up the, the email to get it. So bear with me for just a second here. Okay, uh, I'll let you. Uh, no, that's what I want. Okay, so here's the email from Catherine Klein. So you can you, you can read the the whole thing, and I'll pop up the deed in a minute. So. Um, and you'll see at the very end of it, she says, if housing authority has separate counsel, it probably should be sent along for review by them. So there's that. And, and if you're all set with that, let me pop up the deed itself. 
Well, they weren't saying there was a problem, were they? No, no, they weren't saying there was a problem, but that's just recognition of the fact that the Housing Authority is a separate uh, body politic. Here's the paragraph that's kind of uh, bothering me is... That's, that's wrong, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, that was my reaction when I looked at it, mm -hmm. is that I've got to get back to them because that's not what I asked for. Yeah. We shall grant the property. Here, that's but... right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We shall transfer the property. Transfer, right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and this talks about going directly to an eligible purchaser yes. when we really want to do a uh, to a developer subject to a land disposition agreement that's going to result in it ending up with an eligible purchaser. It strikes me so, that town council is, is unclear on the process. Um, that th This may be what they use in other towns, but in point of fact, not what we have done on any property. Yeah. And in yes. fact, and in fact, you know, here's what I asked for. Yeah. So I, I specifically flagged that we were going to do a uh, RFP to a developer. Mm -hmm. And that's not what I got. So I got a I got a circle back. But this happened, this arrived, you know, Friday afternoon and I didn't see it until the weekend. Okay. So it seems like it could be a simple fix. Uh, I would agree. Mm -hmm. We um Kathleen already referenced the Old Kings Highway. We issued an RFP if, if we could just duplicate the language on the deed uh, in that. I went looking for that deed and I'm not sure exactly where it is. So, hmm. no, I, what, I, I, what about 2082 State Highway? That, that was property we actually purchased ourselves. Right, right. So different. I think it sounds like a simple fix that we should ask them to do with. And if they if they don't agree, we could ask Peter Freeman to look at it. But mm -hmm. um, just clarify that we wanted. To okay. Well. My next step on this is to go back to town council and say, you know, this is not really what I asked for. Uh, can you consider revising it? Mm -hmm. Harry, if it's value to you, we could ask Habitat for a copy of the deed. Yeah, I'm surprised I can't find it. Can we find it on the registry? Yes, we can. But I started looking for deeds into the housing authority and I ended up going back a long time without finding it. So I don't know if it went directly from the town to Habitat or whether it mm. went from the town to the housing authority to Habitat. I don't know. I don't know. So all of that would, well, I can do, I can do some more research. I don't know if anybody else has a resource there. I'll look and I'll look back and see if I have okay. any. Okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll wait a couple of days, and if I don't hear anything, I'll just fire away based on what I know. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's what I've got on that. I did not invite Becky to this meeting. I didn't see any purpose after I discussed it with her, and and I just really don't want to uh, make another unnecessary ask of her because I think she's completely overwhelmed. <clears throat> um. Fiscal support for creation. So we're done with Freeman Ave. Mm -hmm. Okay, fiscal support for creation of accessory dwellings. I had a conversation that actually Jay Coburn initiated on uh, last Friday morning, actually. And oh, I'm corrected, that deed showed up on Thursday, not on Friday. So I was off by a day. So, um, Jay initiated this. He wanted to update uh, me on the CDP's uh, ADU Resource Center. And he introduced uh, a new person, uh, Vicki Crea, C-R-E-A. 
uh, who they have hired to run their ADU Resource Center. Um, and so here's what he told me, or here's what we've discussed. Um, they serve the eight layer, eight, I can't even talk anymore, the eight lower Cape towns. Um, they do collaborate with the Homeless Prevention Council. Um, their focus, the CDP's focus is on ADU creation and they see that as uh, technical assistance. Um, they're working on a website. Um, financial incentives based on ARPA funds that they have been awarded. Um, they, um, they're looking at a $10,000 incentive and it would be an after the fact incentive, you know, once an ADU has been created uh, and it would be restricted to uh, ADUs that are occupied year round, which uh, as we discussed was not really a problem in Wellfleet because they're all restricted that way anyway. Um, and we also talked about what other resources were out there in the community. Uh, in particular, uh, Siemens has, is working on an ADU specific loan package. Uh, I know the Cape Cod 5 has one. And I think Cape, he said he said that Cape Cod Cooperative Bank and First Citizens are also looking at um, you know ways to fund projects like this. Um, he talked about whether it was possible to consolidate the CDP's efforts with the uh, HPC's efforts, and HPC kind of wants to do the whole Cape, so they. Are trying to have a working relationship with the HPC on the eight lower Cape towns, but he thinks that they're ultimately going to end up with encouraging uh, homeowners to apply to both the CDP and and the um, uh, and HAC. Did I keep saying HPC? It really should be homeless HAC. Um, I I told them that uh, we didn't have the staff to be able to manage a program like this in terms of vetting applicants and, and ensuring that awards were consistent with program objectives, that uh, our function was more likely to be a source of funding for incentives of a scale like, uh, like he was talking about. And that, you know, I'd be happy to continue the, the conversation um, and uh, that was basically the conversation. And so that's what's happened since we last talked about this. Um, other questions, comments, Gary? I, I don't know if it's coincidence or not, but uh, we did uh, remind CDP at our meeting on Wednesday last week uh, that they uh, came to our meeting and we said, come back to us in 30 days with a proposal about how we can work together with a financial incentive to um, support the creation of ADUs. Well, Jay initiated this before that meeting. So it was about a week oh, all right. of, of us we, getting our acts together to find right, but, 20 minutes to talk. But we, we did meet with, I think her name is Terry. Yes. At our last meeting, and the takeaway was come back to us for the proposal. Yeah, yeah. Terry and Ann Robinson right. were on that call. Correct. Yeah. I'm not sure if I understood them correctly, but when I asked them how many $10,000 grants they were going to give out, they said 15. I think that's correct. Uh, it's I think it's in the minutes from the last meeting. And that's across eight towns, or did, I wasn't. I didn't clarify whether that was fifteen per town or fifteen mm -hmm. across eight towns. If it's fifteen I, across eight towns, people are going to need some help. <laughs> well, I, I think it's the latter, Elaine, and so that probably means that you know we might be. Have wealthy residents competing competing for one or two of those. 
which right. is all the more reason why uh, if they put together a program that makes sense, maybe we can fund a couple more for Wellfleet specific ADUs. Right. I told him I had to shepherd my funds because I thought he was going to be asking me for a half a million dollars on something else later. <laughs> <clears throat> so other thoughts, other directions we should be going on this? I think we just have to wait a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that's... That's all I have in terms of agenda items. But the items that I have for a future meeting are, you know, kicking the budget down the down the street. Um, also, the uh, grant for a new—is it for a new housing production plan, Elaine, or is it for something more general than that, or? Yeah. You know? I I believe the request was for a housing production plan, and that's mm -hmm. that's an interesting conversation in itself okay. because there are basically three sort of types of plans. But um, yeah, that's a, a conversation and, I think. And is, who's going to manage that? Are we going to do that? Is the housing authority going to do that? Is the town under some other umbrella going to do that? Mm. That's a good question. I mean, I think it'll have to be one of our one of our groups. Okay. And Elaine, can you clarify? Does the money have to be encumbered by December or spent by December? Supposedly spent by December. Well, there's just no way. That's pretty short. Yeah. Well, I was I was looking at a couple of sites of consultants that do these things, and they call it a three to four month project. Okay. Well, that still means that if we if we uh, delay much beyond July 1st, we're going to be in trouble. Mm, yeah. Because so, three to four months can quickly morph into five to six months, you know, without much. I mean, when we got the grant, you know, for the wastewater, which was different, you know, um, <laughs> Mike Trovato did the scope of services and sent it out. And I think the town hired, but I think, you know, since this is so specifically housing related, we'll have to. We'll have to talk with Becky about that. Well, it would be better if the trust entered into it because the trust is an entity of the town, mm -hmm. whereas the housing yeah. authority isn't really. Yeah, I think it, okay. would, it would make sense for the trust. Uh, yeah. Okay, I will put it on the next agenda, but I, I think it's probably wise that somebody start doing something before then. Well, uh, the, uh, the commission will get in touch with Becky. Okay. About, I mean, the next step on our other grant was to get a scope of services approved by them yep. and then get it out. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other things I have for the next agenda are trying to get some more intelligence about uh, the community impact fee on the short-term rentals and I guess possibly on the cottage colony and on uh, budget. Harry. Yes. The partnership is looking at uh, whether we should um, offer an amendment to the multifamily bylaw mm -hmm. for the 2023 town meeting. Um, and I'd love to get input at either the next meeting or a subsequent meeting of the trust. Okay. Whether that's a viable idea or not. Okay. Well, if you send it along, I'll be happy to put it on an agenda. I would just say multifamily uh, zoning bylaw change. Okay. I'm looking at, back at my email, and hopefully it says December 2023 instead of 2022. <laughs> well whatever it is we'll deal with it okay um next meeting date i will be away may 1st through the 6th so that week is not good uh but beyond that uh 
uh, I'm wondering if we can go back to a consistent Monday, if that could work. I would like to do that. Mm -hmm. okay. you know, just w it just won't be easy for me to do a uh, um, remote on Monday, the 2nd of May. Would you like to do it on the 9th, Harry? The 9th would be fine. Why don't we just plan to do it then? Mm. I think we were trying to do the second Monday of the month for a while. Which, which I'm okay with generally. Mm -hmm. Or was oh. it, Mike, but you have your select board the second Tuesday of the month, right? So I, yeah. think, we, I think we were trying to space it out for you. Well, it doesn't. I mean, it's it's the same amount of meetings, so it doesn't really matter. I don't mind doing a Monday and then a Tuesday. Okay. Right after, it doesn't really matter. Then I have no meetings the next week sometimes. <laughs> so. And I I do uh, seven p.m. I I continue to do it remote unless there's a move afoot to meet in person. We're allowed to continue to do meetings this way until at least July fifteenth. It's nice, especially when we end at nine o'clock to already be home. Yes. I gotta, I gotta, especially with a five per six person, you know, a seven person meeting. It, yeah. Cause I, I gotta start thinking about dinner once this is finished. Um, okay. So May the night, 7 PM virtual. I've got some agenda items. Last item of business I have is the, uh, minutes for May 7th, March, uh, March 7th, uh, let's, let's pop that up. Um, there was, uh, one correction and what I've done this time to try and make, make it easier to figure out what's, what's what here is I have track changes on. So it's, uh, can't find it. Huh? <laughs> I can look and see what it was. You probably have a copy of it. Hmm. It was just, just one word. It was uh, uh, there was an extra the in there or something. Oh my. It was under number six. Yeah, there it is. This <laughs> little tiny yellow yeah. T right there. <laughs> that was it. That was it. I moved the minutes of March what was the seventh. March seventh. I moved the minutes of March seventh. Okay, second. Second by Kathleen. Um, okay, we'll do a quick roll call vote. Uh, Mike. Aye. Uh, Jim. Aye. Gary. Aye. Kathleen. Aye. Elaine. Aye. Sharon. Aye. Chair votes aye, seven in favor, none opposed. Motion to adjourn, please. So moved. So moved. <laughs> okay, Second. Mike, Mike and Jim. Uh, Mike? Aye. Jim? Aye. Gary? Aye. Kathleen? Aye. Elaine? Aye. Sharon? Aye. Chair votes aye. It is uh, 8.50 and we are adjourned. Have a good evening, can, can everybody. Can I answer a quick Thank question? You. Did yes, we ever hear back from that COA person? Remember, we were talking about that house of a senior. Are you talking no. to me? Yeah, you, Kathleen. We talked okay. with. Uh, um, I have not heard anything no, more. I, I hadn't either, so I just wanted to. Yeah. Okay, I'll just stop the recording. Thank you. Goodbye. Have a good night, Bye. everybody. Thank everybody. you. Bye. Bye.